Hey, it's time for voiceover body shop tech talk. Tech talk. Yes. We got a lot. We're here to talk about your home voiceover studio, which is what George and I do basically every day. We know what it's all about. And what are we going to talk about tonight? Um, a little rant about universal audio. Yeah. Um, what to do when you spill liquid in your laptop, what not to do. Um, maybe a way you can ear uh, upgrade your ailing headphones or even new headphones in a way that might be surprisingly comfortable. Um, why I like the Magic Trackpad Trackpad Two. Um, and don't use RX processing in a stack. And maybe some other stuff if we have time. We have a lot to talk about. Yeah, we're going to talk about some processing stuff that's driving me nuts as well. Plus, all your questions. We've had a few mailed in. And if you've got a question, throw them in the chat room and we'll get to them. It's time for Tech Talk Voice Over Body Shop right now. From the outer reaches, they came. Bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together... From the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Widom, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master. A professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, making the complex simple, debunking the myths of what it takes to create great-sounding audio, answering your questions, showing you the latest and greatest in VO tech, and having a dandy time doing it. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters. And VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Well, hello there. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop. Or VO. B S Tech Talk Tech Talk Tech Talk Tech Talk Okay. Well, we're here to help you with your home voiceover studio. And George and I get you know, we get calls in the middle of the night, essentially. Uh <laughs> Dan did. <laughs> Dan took one for the team right there and midnight your time. Yes. It somebody was. in Valencia, Spain, a wonderful town, by the way, which I've actually been mm. to. Uh, solving your problems, also trying to get you to do it right in the first place. And there's a way it's supposed to sound. There's what I, what I like to say, what it's Whistle. supposed to sound like. Whistle. I said that the other day. I was doing, I don't know what I was talking on some panel, but I spelled it out. Whistle, baby. That's right. You know, but how is it supposed to sound? Everybody hears things differently, but it's those subtle little things. And we'll talk about this a little bit later that, that, you know, that really don't matter. It's like the sound you have is the sound you have as long as it doesn't sound bad. Right. And how do you prevent things from sounding bad? We also and, want to prevent you from buying gear you don't need or well, just yeah. really, really complicated, expensive gear. It's got nothing to do with voiceover that you don't need. That's what that's another biggie. We want you to sound good, sound like you, sound real, and not overspend and be overwhelmed with technical crap, right? That you don't exactly. need, yeah. Yet we're always talking about this stuff, but maybe we should just say, Look, this is great stuff, but you don't need it unless you're like a musician or recording an album, or because all of this stuff almost. Absolutely every little piece that we use in voiceover 
was never designed for voiceover. They're not sitting there in boardrooms at some of these big tech companies going, we need to make a voiceover microphone. It's one not yet. You know, they, <laughs> it's, it's all about music, a little bit about, you know, uh, electronic news gathering and uh, that sort of stuff. But voiceover is really like an afterthought. And so we're just adapting it to our uses. So George and I have been, been, you know, we've been in this business for so long. We've learned everything that there is to know eh, about <laughs> how it's supposed to work. Sometimes we forget half of what we knew. That I might know. be the part of the problem too. <laughs> yeah. What, what gets me is how much people don't know how much they don't know, especially yeah. when they're starting. Anyway, if you want to work with one of us and get yourself started right, or you have a technical issue that you can't solve and you want to talk to George, where do you go? Head over to georgethe.tech. And if that domain name makes your head spin, georgethetech.com also works. I got a menu on there of services, all kinds of ways I can help you with my sound check to a, a, a customized processing rack, which we'll talk about later when and when not to do that. Studio design, getting Source Connect working, all kinds of good stuff. And Dan does a similar type of thing over at his place on the net. And that is homevoiceoverstudio.com. Right there. There it is. Yeah. Go on over to homevoiceoverstudio.com and uh, let's talk. Uh, you know, you can communicate for me uh, with me from there, uh, or you can submit a specimen in my specimen collection cup. Uh, let me see what your audio is sounding like. I want to hear it raw. I, you know, people are like, I, I, well, I used to, uh, you know, my, my, my DBX 286 a on this and it makes it sound great. Like, no, none of that stuff. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. We need it raw because there's going to be clients that are very picky and they want it raw. Exactly. So you can't hide. Right. I want to hear what your raw sound is, what you're working with. If there are minor little corrections we need to make, you know, if you've already tried to make those corrections, well, you've done it for your ear. The problem is, is you don't hire you. So you may not know exactly what it is that it's supposed to sound like. Mm -hmm. So join me, join me over at homevoiceoverstudio.com. All righty. Well, George, it's time for your weekly or bi-monthly, I guess we could call it your tech update. What do we got? Mm. Well, first I got to have a little bit of sad, kind of bad, sad news. Um, I have been supporting and I'm not going to stop doing it but I've been setting up and supporting folks using the Universal Audio Apollo line of audio interfaces for, there's for some reason the number 10 keeps popping up. Our anniversary, how long I've been in setting these up, et cetera. Been using them a long time. And unfortunately, I don't know, and, and, and the thing is we're not getting any feedback from them to understand what's going on exactly over at Universal Audio, but the support, to put it mildly, has been lacking. Uh, I see a lot of complaints about this. And I, I've made my own Facebook group to to be able to communicate with all the people out there that use Universal Audio Apollo. And it's called, um, I have to even look it up. It's called Universal Audio Apollo 4VO. There's another one out there, but this one is the one I created for, really for voiceover mostly. It has over a thousand people in it. And so we've been gathering information about some folks who have had a technical issue, which we uh, call... Tim Tippett started this thread, by the way. So if you see the thread from Tim, it's talking about the whooshing sound. Needless to say, uh, this thread's been going on for over a year and three months, and it's still going. That means there are still people getting this product, and the particular one that we seem to be having the most trouble with is the Apollo Twin Mark II. That's the charcoal gray version, not the older silver one or the new, new silver ones. Not the Twin X, not the Solo, but apparently the, tw the Mark II has had this issue and it's been happening to everybody and anybody. I'm not saying, I shouldn't say that. It doesn't happen to everybody. I think it'd be better if it did. If it happened to everybody, it'd be easier to get a recall on this and get everybody's replaced. But it's been a, it's been a pain to a lot of folks and it's really soured me to recommending products from Universal Audio. To the point where I made a declaration that I said I wasn't going to anymore. And I'm going to have to stick to that. Um, I'm going to recommend other, other equipment. It doesn't mean that the Apollo is any less amazing for those who need those features. And know how to which use is, 
Yeah, and know how to use them. And there's a very small percentage of you watching who really actually need <laughs> the features of an Apollo. Um, but it's it's frustrating. So that's just I wanted to get that out of the way. They really need to take a play out of Apple Apple's customer service model, which is always been stellar. I've had Apple products replaced years out of warranty just because they realized that there was a manufacturing problem with their equipment. They, they owned up to it and then they replaced it with a new device, not a replacement device, but a new generation of equipment, like an entirely new generation of equipment to stop the bleeding and to correct a wrong. Yeah. So and Universal Audio, please. Yeah. But they're such they're Jeez. such a great company. I remember you and I being at NAM a couple of years ago and listening to the digital versus analog processors that they had. And it was like, where are you going? Bill Putnam, the guy whose name created Universal Audio, he's not with us anymore. And if he was, I hate to be so cliche, but the man would probably be rolling in his grave if he knew that the company he started wasn't helping people with these kinds of issues. I mean they definitely have the marketing budget. Dan and I saw their, I see their insane booth every year at NAMM, uh, and they are pervasive, and they're sitting on the desk at in Billie Eilish's bedroom where she's recording Grammy-winning records. Everybody knows they're amazing, but they're it's it's frustrating. All right, that's enough of that. Right. Spilling liquid in your laptop. Oops. Anybody ever do this, Dan? I haven't done it, but I gave anybody in the family my, by chance my MacBook Air, and he was in Chicago. He says, "Oh yeah, I spilled Pepsi on it." Mm. Regular Pepsi or Diet Pepsi? It didn't matter. Ooh, well, <laughs> Diet Pepsi doesn't have real sugar, so it's not as big of a problem. Okay, so tell us what to do. Oh, by the way, you remember those seen those guys, the Mentos fountains that stick Mentos in in Coke? Oh yeah, yeah. They always use Diet Coke. Why? Because there's no actual sugar. So when it rains down on you, you're not sticky. Ah. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> don't drink regular Coke near your computer. Point being is um, you want to avoid it, but it, it's going to happen. Um, my daughter, unfortunately, did it to her MacBook Air. No. It was the second MacBook Air she had killed. Well, okay, it's not fair to say. The first one <laughs> died more or less on its own. Died a natural death. Apparently, because I've had it apart, and the little white dots inside that turn red when something's wet, they're all they're all white. And I showed her that. I said, "You can't get away with anything." There's little white dots all inside this computer. If any of them's red, I know you got water in this thing. But the second one was killed by water, and what she did that really exacerbated the problem. It was that I guess she thought it had dried out or just didn't know what to do, and she plugged the power in after it already happened. And that seemed to fry some portion of the computer. Well, I thought for sure. We're, it's a dunner. But I also had her prior dead MacBook Air, and I took them apart. And here's a little movie. Okay, both of these Macs are, not, are dead right now, but this one has no water damage. And this one does. Look at these chips right here all rusty and look at that right there that never ever spill water in a computer I think you dried it out and then plug it in never never a good idea oh ella <laughs> if you see this you know you've done damage to your computer really? but it's this is what a good one so looks corroded. like this is the io board and i was lucky to have it and here's my workstation where I was doing all the work. Coffee table. And here's an example of the water sensor. A white means good, a red means wet. And there's what the soldered in RAM looks like on the bottom of the motherboard. Okay, I swapped out the power module and the battery from another dead MacBook Air. And is this gonna boot up? Is it gonna be a miracle? I didn't know. And it made that ding. And that wasn't the computer, it was my phone, but it was just such a weird coincidence. And then I wait. And I wait. Da, 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 da. Oh, oh my god. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh my god, I heard the fan. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> OMG. I can't believe I did it. <laughs> so miracles. 
do happen. Do do not try this at home unless you're Jordan with it. That was crazy. So yeah, so I mean, there's not much in these computers anymore. Like there's a sort a main board that was the large thing you saw. You could see the bottom of the board, and then there's another little one to the side, and that's called the I/O board, and that's what had all that corrosion and stuff on it. And I looked at the other computer and was like, that all looks perfect on this one. Let's see what happens. And there we go. So lucky. So lucky. So the, the one, yeah. So the one that got wet had all like, you even saw rust on a couple of the chips, right? That's what's in the computer now. And it's working fine, thankfully. But anyway, uh, oh, uh, Sue asked, how long ago did she do it? It was just like three or four days ago. It was still wet enough in there that maybe she did it twice and didn't tell me the first time. She may have done it two times and didn't tell me the first time, maybe. But when I took it apart, there was moisture in there. There was moisture in there. There's videos online. People say, put your computer in rice. Um, it's better to use silica gel or a desiccant. So when you get packages in the mail and they have desiccant gels, those little packets that you never, ever feed to a dog, um, they're really dangerous. But they're Save they're, them from all your prescriptions. Yes, but they come in a lot of things. So save those away. Put them in a box or in a bag in your drawer. You'll want them that day you spill water in your computer because you can put all that in a big bag with a de desk and leave it set for two days. Be patient. Do not touch it. And then turn it back on. There's a very good chance it will come back alive. So a little tip to save your butt and a lot of money. Ella was literally getting ready. To, she said, I gave her money for her birthday and she had she was ready to spend her hard-earned Hard earned money um, <laughs> on a new computer. And I, and, I, and I saved her a lot of money. Um, here's another one ear pads. So, oh, I don't have those ear pads. Those headphones are in the other room. Darn it. Um, there are upgraded ear pads for a lot of headphones. Now, one of the few headphones, in my opinion, that don't need upgraded ear pads are the, these Biodynamics because they have these huge, soft, velour you, ear pads, ears. which I really, really like. But there's a lot of headphones that don't have the velour ear pads for various reasons. But I found them online as a retrofit, something you can swap out. And um, they fit a lot of headphones um, because there's a lot of commonly common sized ear pads. So Audio Technica, a lot of the Audio Technicas, Sony's. And based on the size and shape of Harlan's headphones, I am 99% sure these would fit his as well. And it dramatically upgrades the comfort, in my opinion of a lot of these headphones because they're thicker and softer, have a deeper cup, and uh, they're really great. Now, it's hard to find these online because not that they're hard to find, but you have to swim through a tremendous amount of stuff to find the ones that I happen to get. So we'll post the link somewhere, but it's amzn.to. This is one of those shortened links, slash two capital M, capital G, and then all lowercase R-H-D-K. That's the shortest link I could come up with. But these are the air pads that I found that I really, really, really like. And I'm going to try to put them on Harlan's can, uh, the VO, the voiceover headphones, and see how they fit. Let me double check that. She got it on the screen. There it is. That looks perfect. Yes. Nicely done. Check those out. They're really awesome. In other gear... I got a new Apple Magic trackpad. Now, I've been, I'm a fan of the trackpads, and I have been for years. I've been using this one. But I'm annoyed how I have to put new batteries in it all the time. It drives me nuts. And I was like, why can't they just make a USB trackpad? Well, they sort of do. It's the new, the, the trackpad 2. Now, this one's internally rechargeable. And so the irony is you're paying a lot of money for the fact that it's rechargeable. <laughs> it's $150. For this trackpad, it's frustrating, but you can plug it in and it comes with a USB. And as long as it's plugged into the computer, it's not only charging, but it's also now working as a USB trackpad. What a concept! So, if you're always been annoyed by wireless trackpads, things that need batteries replacement, connectivity issues, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, if the new one is it'll it's double duty, it's Bluetooth and it works plugged in and will stay plugged in and work all the time. So Wow, thank that you. That is an improvement. I mean, the old magic mouse was, you know, you plug that into a regular lightning cable and boom. And but, you know, they put it on the bottom of the mouse, so you, you don't have that option to plug it in and charge it and use it. At the same time, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of weird. So so I'm glad they, they did this one right. All right, they nailed it. Um, 
Dan's got a Mac uh, Mini uh, M1. We've talked about it a bit, and he's he's got it working, which he can give us an update about in a second. I've got one sitting at the UPS store that I need to desperately go pick up tomorrow first thing, plug it in, do exactly what Dan did, migrate all everything over, and cross my fingers and see how it goes. But I'm excited about that. So I'll have more reports on that as well to corroborate what Dan's experience has been. Um, and one last thing, two things. I'll make these really quick. One, I'm getting people sending me audios to check out, sound checks or whatever, where the levels are pretty much right at as close to clipping as you can get, or probably normalized to zero or minus one. And I'm finding out that people are doing this because they're like, well, it's the only way I can get close to the right RMS levels on my file. And they just don't realize that that is a finished spec for audition, for files that you're going to send in to an audiobook publisher. Okay, so in the context of audiobooks, those specs are for the finished file, the mastered file. Don't try to record levels that always fall in the right RMS just by delivering them that way. It's not easy. It's very hard. You're going to probably clip. Don't do that. Let's talk about processing, and then I can talk about the RX thing okay, in context that's right. of this. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I get a lot of questions, uh, people saying, I use this process, and we're talking about this at the top of the show. Does anyone really understand the what, why, when, and how, and what's the easiest choice? You know, I'm of the opinion that if you do it all right up front, and we talk about this every week, if your acoustics are good, there's no exterior noise, there's no major reflection inside the space you're recording. If you use your microphone right, if you're at the right distance from it and are not talking directly into the diaphragm and getting Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, you know, you'll notice I never have a plosive and there's no pop screen on here. Um, and, you know, mic technique is very, very important. Uh, you know, if you're, you have to yell or whatever. You need to learn how to use the proximity of the mic and setting proper input levels. If you get all those three things, even though part one is part A and part B, if you get out those things right, there really shouldn't be any need for processing unless you are specifically told by a producer, as George was just saying, you're sending in a, a finished product. But we get these questions all the time. Well, should I use RX this? And I should I use that? And how do I change it with the EQ? And how do I take it? They're all little tiny minor corrections. These are not processes to use to make you sound better. Because if you don't sound good up front, especially if you don't like your voice, you're in the wrong business. I look at it to the bad makeup job. Yeah. Remember that's, remember an airplane? You don't want to be the lady in the bathroom in the airplane. <laughs> or shaving in there. With course. makeup. Yeah. <laughs> with with your with your processing is what I mean to say. You don't want to be you don't want to be that person. Um it's gotta be very subtle, extremely transparent, not even noticeable, but extremely tastefully done. And be really careful about just always throwing in some declicking or mm. denoising uh plug in right it's uh you got to be really careful with that because th that's whether you really hear it or not it does have a small degradating effect on the sound quality and um you know a really picky production uh casting person or an engineer who's taking your audio raw and here's the artifacts and whatever from that are going to not be too happy so don't make that like, I always add these things. Put them in when they are needed. Know right. when they're needed and use them only at that time. Do not right. just slather everything in this stuff. Don't put salt on everything you eat, folks. Taste it first. Not good for your heart. Listen yeah. to it. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah you, you really do need to know what it's supposed to sound like. And it's supposed to sound completely natural. Like you're in the same room with somebody. We don't talk to other people through compression and EQ and certainly not through RX, you know, through isotope. I mean, God, it would be great if we could, but we don't. They're really looking for the natural sound of your voice. And every time you start trying to fix these things, there's always a physical answer to it. Exterior noise, better isolation. If you've got, you know, reverb in your room, better acoustical treatment. If you've got mouth noise, learn technique 
to get rid of it. Don't rely on the technological solutions. And I know there's probably people out there going, what, no processing? Because, cripes, I get that every day. And I know you do too, George. It's like, I mean, you, you do stacks for people, and uh, but those are for minor little corrections and for specific things for specific things, right? Yeah, they're not like meant to be an overall, just put this on everything. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all, one-click wonder, fix everything you do. It's really specific to a specific, specific to a genre, as in, in a particular situation. Um, now, if I'm making one that's extremely gentle, maybe it just rolls off the low end because you had a little bit of rumble. Maybe it filters a little bit of the sibilance out just because I dipped a little bit around six to eight k or whatever in the EQ, and that's you know not much else. Then that's something that's corrective that you can use probably all the time safely, but you need to know when it's safe to use it. And when it's appropriate to use it. So just, yeah, just sure. oh. ask. Yeah. Engineers that know how to use this stuff have learned it over 10, 20 years. It really takes years to really master the, the art and the subtlety that you're trying to accomplish there. And mm -hmm. you don't like hit it with a sledgehammer, which a lot of people do yeah. anyway. So you were going to talk about don't put RX in a stack. Yeah. I was, I mean, I was sort of touched on the fact that the problem with putting RX in a stack it implies, I guess what I'm saying is that implies that it's something that you apply um, compulsor a compulsory thing that you do it every time. Let's say you have a stack that's for doing a commercial audition. If you just apply this mouth declicker and God forbid a debreather in a stack where you're just automatically trying to debreath or fix your auditions so you don't have to do it in a 30 second commercial is not going to come out every time the right way. It could make it sound worse. It's just not a good idea. Those kinds of tools should be used sparingly and when necessary. It should not be a part of your everyday process. So that's really what I was implying about using things like RX in a stack. All righty. Well, if you've got a question for us, although we just covered a quite a pile there, um, Throw it in the chat room right now, because George and I will get to your questions about your home voiceover studio and technology uh, related to that right after these incredibly important messages. Let's see those questions now. This is Ariana Ratner, and you're listening to VoiceOver Body Shop, VOBS.TV. I was talking to Harlan Hogan this morning. He described Chicago as having permafrost with more snow on the way but something warmed his heart a letter from a satisfied voiceover essentials customer and here's what he said hi harlan getting started in the voiceover business and want a big value for your dollar look no further than harlan's portabooth pro and the vo1a mic these got me started and have proven valuable in producing over 50 titles on audible great results for a great price right out of the box douglas burke the agile narrator so if you do audiobooks, clearly these two products from VoiceOverEssentials.com can help you get it done. Go on over to VoiceOverEssentials.com to see all the great voiceover recording equipment and accessories you'll ever need. That's VoiceOverEssentials.com, the home of Harlan Hogan's signature series products like the VO1A mic and the Porter Booth Pro and Plus. Thanks, Harlan. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big-voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? Stick around. You don't want to miss this. What you do. Power 103.9. At Target, we want you to come as you are. Be comfortable. Uh, okay, maybe not bathrobe comfortable. Pants for the customer in aisle four, please. Nuevo México necesita un cambio. La representante Michelle Lujan Grisham ha luchado por nuestro estado en la Cámara de Representantes. Watch anywhere, anytime on an unlimited number of devices. Sign in with your Netflix account to watch instantly at Netflix.com. The ice cream maker is a big risk that can have huge rewards until you forget to turn it on. Well, that's it, guys. Time is up. Hey, it's JMC. Thanks for watching the VoiceOver Body Shop. If you're demo ready or looking to get there, check out jmcdemos.com and see a sample of our work. Now let's get back to Dan and George and this week's tech wisdom. All right, I'll make this quick. Source Connect. You've heard of it by now, right? Dan, why aren't you using it? 
Do you don't know how to use it? It's intimidating? Okay. You don't need to worry about that so much. Just go to source-elements.com. Get yourself set up over there. Their support is now 24-7, and they've got a pretty big team now of folks that can train and get you up and running with this with no additional charge. Now, if you get a demo, and you can do that, you can get a 15-day free demo, you won't get that extra level of support. You're a little bit more on your own, and if you're kind of like not feeling like you don't want to make any commitments, you can watch. There's an hour-long tutorial on how to use it. I did it. It's at georgethetech slash sc. You can watch that, but really, just sign up, get the subscription, get the ball rolling, and get that training from them and that additional guidance they provide. Absolutely worth it. And just amp up your career. It's time to do it. Get up there and go do it. Thanks, Source Elements. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Bill Farmer, and you are watching Voice Over Body Shop. It's great. And we are back here on Tech Talk on uh, Voice Over Body Shop. We've got a bunch of questions from uh, our audience, but you had one more thing to talk about with RX7 and Stacks. Yeah, actually, one of, what I wanted to say was the saying, don't use them in the Stacks. But, so when do you use them? And I feel like the RX tools in general are really suited for your editing process. So I think of it as more like you're editing and you realize, ah, oh, there's some mouth clicks that are right here and I just can't seem to deal with it properly. What do I do? Oh, this would be a great time to use the mouth declicker from RX and then fix that with a mouth declick. Or um, I'm doing this e-learning thing and they don't want breaths and I breathe. What do I do? Now use a debreather, remove the breaths, and then go on and do your editing. I really feel like those tools are really more mostly suited to be used during the uh, editing process. Maybe the only uh, exception would be the voice to noise. If it's set up correctly and it really is part of your process to finish your files, then maybe that would be appropriate in a stack. Maybe that one. But the other ones I really feel are very much specific to a particular situation. So that's how I think of those. Use them during editing. All right. All righty. We, we got a letter this week from, from Julio Perez. He says, uh, I know you've been providing us listeners with uh, a, a VOBS and with your ongoing experience with the new M1 based Max. Mm -hmm. He says, I just saw an article in case you're mm -hmm. wondering which article, mm -hmm. uh, which you may wish to keep an eye on uh, your new acquisitions to mitigate any premature storage failures. Make sure you have some sort of backup in place. What the article was saying was in a very low percentage of cases where SSDs were failing. Mm. Uh, you know, solid state drives that, you know, these are not movable spinning discs there. They only have so many cycles or cycles of, of memory. Or whatever right. it is. But, you know, you and I both read that article and it was, it, it was like, this is pretty incomplete data, isn't it? Yeah. I, I have to read it again. I can't remember how they were, com if they were comparing it to, the previous generation Max and the failure rates of the SSDs and the and the prior generation of Max. Um, do you remember if that was in there, Dan? I'd have to yeah, it, it really didn't. It was talking about the fact that SSDs, you know, fail. But they do. They do look, fail. Everything fails. Everything fails. I, you you really do not think of them as more reliable than anything else. Um, you know, when a hard drive fails, sometimes it's it's curtains. You lose it all. But sometimes with hard drives, it can, you can lose a portion of the data and get the rest back. But generally with flash memory, and SSDs are a, a type of flash memory storage, that usually, it's, it, if it crashes, it's gone in a flash. It's, like it's all gone. In a lava flow. <laughs> yeah, so it's gone. Um, back up, back up, back up. I, yeah, it, I'm hearing you know things about, I've heard that article now. There's another article going around about, hey, there's actually malware for the Apple Silicon computers. Well, wow, newsflash. I mean, there's viruses on every platform. There really is. There's just, it's just, if you do the same things you've always done, don't, I don't, at this point, I haven't seen anything that says a new M1 is way more vulnerable or way less reliable. It's still very, very early. And Dan and I did jump on it early. We jumped on these M1s early because it was so compelling. The value was so good. We may find out 
that there's something in a year from now that we didn't anticipate. I'm buying Apple Care for that reason. I haven't bought it yet, but I'll, if you buy it within the first year, you get three years warranty. And maybe it's not a bad idea because of this stuff being such new, new technology. Theoretically new technology. I mean, really the guts of an M1 a Silicon Mac is, is, a, is a chip that's been in development now in one form or another since the iPad came out. So it isn't all that new. These guys yeah. have been doing this a really, really long time. They just scaled it up to be desktop worthy. So, yeah. uh, well, I got, I got, I got a good feeling about this. So. Yeah, you know, I, I set it up. The only problems I'm having is it forgot some passwords in the migration. Right. And I'm like, where did I write that down? I know that's that's <laughs> the that's going to happen because once you have a new piece of hardware, when you clone over a system. For security reasons, it makes you re-authenticate everything. Yeah. I mean, so, I've got, and I've got to transfer the license from Source Connect from the old Mac Mini to the new one. And I, That's the iLock. It's, it's the iLock management app. Not too bad. It's actually kind of cool. Question yeah. from Tom W. All right. Uh, let's see. Hi, guys. I was on the Sweetwater site and decided to compare my Rode NT1 with the venerable Neumann U87. And it turns out the difference is mm, a rounding error, about $3,000. I know there are real differences in hardware, but I don't know what they are. Can you explain the details? Um, well, one's made in Germany, and one's made in Germany by hand, which takes probably hours to do, and uh, is a design that's many, many years old. And it's sort of the archetype of the studio microphone that every microphone coming after it has essentially been emulating. So that's the U87. Um, there are technical differences, like. The U87 is a switchable pattern mic, so it does cardioid, figure eight, and omni. Uh, NT1 is much, much simplified by having just one pattern with no switches of any kind. And it's a well-known fact that microphones that don't have any switches or any switchable circuits tend to be quieter, have lower self-noise. Um, so that's another reason for doing so. It's much harder to make all those switches and everything not cause any noise or cause any problems. Right. Well, so, as my brother always says, you know, the more things you put on something, the more that can go wrong with it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. 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 So that's, those are the big things. Um, sound quality wise, the NT one's a damn good value proposition. That's a great way to get a step in the right direction. And then when you land that big fat gig, you reward yourself and get you the Neumann U87 you've always thought you wanted. Yeah. Or go out for ice cream. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's... Three, or not anymore. 8,000, no. Four th I'm trying to do the math. What's ice cream cost? In <laughs> Venice, it's like six bucks for a one scoop nowadays. <laughs> Jesus. Hey, you so lose expensive. You to live. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, we've, we've talked about this before, that for every, you know, $500, you go up in price of something, the increase in quality is is negligible yeah. there is not a microphone that's going to change the way you perform copy you know we had marilyn wisner on last week and she was talking about just be different you know you don't want your audio to sound bad but if you have something like an nt1 you know that's that's one factor out of the out of the checklist that's going to cause problems mm -hmm. it's a very quiet mic it re reproduces your voice as you exist what is it that the u87 does it doesn't make you Superman it works <laughs> for women. It's just, it's just a mic that is incredibly sensitive. The more sensitive it is, the better the environment you have to have in which to record, or it's going to hear all the flaws that you have in your space. It's a Versace runway gown for the red carpet. And if you don't have a body for it, it ain't going to look too good. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting way to put it i guess <laughs> it's, it's the dress for your yes, voice that's right if you don't have the voice it ain't gonna sound so good on a u87 you, you can't put lipstick on a pig is what <laughs> once said yeah don't don't you know if if you like if you're a geek and you like having great microphones and stuff like that sure go for it it's not going to change your voiceover career start with a good mic like the nt1 and all the other ones that are over $200, $250, you know, you get under that, then you're going to have, have, have some problems. But there are some great mics that are in that price range, too. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. the sound you have is the sound you have. And as long as it's reproducing you properly, 
upgrading to a better mic is not going to change anything. Are you guys tired yet of hearing Dan on a on a three hundred dollar VO one A? Because that's what you hear him on every, every week, every single episode. <laughs> it's a darn good mic. It is. Um, Jeff asks, uh, "How close can I get to my four sixteen Sennheiser four sixteen? <laughs> that's a loaded question in yeah, itself we um, don't want to know about your personal relationships <laughs> um, is there a position that's too close as long as I'm not making plosives and is the proximity effect different than on a large diaphragm condenser mic well yes those are all good questions and I think Dan we should do a little test since I'm on a shotgun mic I'm not on a 416 Right. this is a Rode NTG5 but it's going to behave rather yeah, similarly um, and then you're on a large diaphragm. So I'm going right. to turn off all my processing. Okay. Okay. So now this is as raw as it gets. And I'm going to get up close and I'm going to try not to pop the mic because I'm going to point it at the corner of my mouth and I'm going to get really in tight right now. And so I'm kind of eating the mic and then I'm going to back away, back away, back away, back away, back away. Did you guys perceive a big difference in low end? Dan, just just, just just slight proximity just effect bit. just a little bit and yeah, now you do it okay and you know i'm not going to change the volume of my voice at all i'm not going to change my volume at all i'm just going to get closer and you can hear the difference a lot more proximity is. effect yes. exactly it's, it's proximity little, effect is that buildup of the of the low end it, it, it is what causes that is apparently a bone of contention between byron wagner and i oh really uh, interesting <laughs> Yeah, like, hmm. but Byron is probably right because he is a super genius. <laughs> he is a mm, yes, super super mad genius. Um, uh, but yes, there is a minor amount of proximity effect. It's not that much. Um, you can get pretty dang close, as you just noticed, without popping it. Right. But the closer you are to a mic, the much easier it is to slip up and pop it. So, exactly. Yeah. Yet that sweet spot is really tiny right. when yeah, you're but, right here. Yeah, you can use a pop screen with a 416. If you're the thing is, is you don't get that close to a 416 unless you're like doing promo and imaging. And, you know, and, and you can put a windsock on it. Which, That's the only pop screen I have right now. Right. And it, it, it does it make a big difference. It couldn't height. Not a big difference. There was an argument about this on, uh, I think, the Gardner Collective or the voiceover community yeah. one of the facebook groups to argue about and there was there a little i mean it was a debate about whether this changes the sound of a 416 one of these things and uh it was entertaining i chimed in with a wise ass answer because i could because <laughs> i knew everybody in the debate so i felt like i could get away with it but the bottom line was is that one person said it makes a noticeable difference for him so he never uses it and another person says i've done the tests and it makes no difference okay. so agree to disagree it, the, the thing is, is if you're doing it using the 416 for regular commercial voiceover stuff and it's not a driven image promo type of thing, you know, you're going to be, it's the same rules that, that, that apply to a regular studio condenser mic. You're going to be five to yeah. seven, maybe even 12 inches away. And, you know, and, and it should pick you up very naturally. If you're doing promo, yeah, you can get right up to it. But, you know, there's that great Hook Studios uh, double, um, uh, I think they've gone up to triple now. It's got like triple, triple foil yeah. screens in front right. of it. And right. And if I have to do a spot like that or I have to do some promo or something like, you know, I'll throw that on there because then you do attack it straight on. But mostly, as George and I say, 45 degrees pointing at your chest, you know, a good distance away, it's going to pick you up just fine. Remember, it was designed to pick up the human voice from not an inch, but from a fair distance. Very far, yeah. Mm -hmm. so it was designed as a video mic. All right. Oh. You got the next one? Uh, yeah. Rowdy59, Will, uh, from YouTube. Are ACX guidelines sufficient to follow for most auditions? Well, that's a good uh, question, actually. Yeah. I, and, of course, it depends on if you're doing audio books or doing commercial stuff. Uh, I would not say for commercials. I don't know. No, I think no. the ACX specs requires over compression. Yeah, but he's talking just about auditions. You know, I think if you're yeah. sending auditions to do a, an audio book and heck, if you go on ACX, there's so many books in there, you know, just throw your voice in there. Eventually somebody's going to hire you. Well, I guess that's the question is most auditions, most 
auditions, most audiobook just, auditions. Most they just want to hear how you read, right? Most and then, auditions in general. What 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 is the context? Yeah. I, I, I yeah, well, I think he says for most auditions, and I think that no, the ACX uh, specs. If you're talking about their finished products, specs specs have nothing to do with commercial voiceover. So, yeah, I don't think I would do it on a commercial. When I do settings for commercial voiceover, a stack or whatever, it's way more subtle. It it does it it doesn't auditions ACX audio to me sounds very processed. It has a very distinctive sound. Yeah, and and then stuff for commercial to me should be very transparent and exactly. natural. Exactly. So that's those are general things, but I, I wouldn't just lean on that for everything. All right, uh, Pam Wood. My favorite subject here. Go for Discuss. it. Discuss smiley face. <laughs> well, she's not asking what's the right mic for voiceover, but it's a good question. Uh, mics right side up or upside down. I have a new AKG P420. Nice mic. Um, Dan, you have yeah. a very good spiel you say all the time for this, how to yeah. position the mic. Yeah. If you've got it. The, the idea is, is that your ears are at the same plane as your eyes and you want a con studio condenser mic to hear you the way other people hear you. So the way I have it set here is it's Dan's up, mic's up, out of the frame. Oh, there it is. You have it in the frame now. It's, yeah. it's, it's right there. It's, you know, it should be at about the bridge of your nose, the bottom of the mic, the top, which is actually the top of the mic upside like down. The reasons for doing this number of reasons. Number one, it totally prevents Explosives, and you're not really talking off axis. You're talking straight at the mic, but more the way people's ears hear you. Number two, copy is down here. And you can just, by looking at it down there, the mic gets out of your field of vision. You and can see it. You're not reminded that you're on a microphone, which tends to make people talk a little bit louder. And number three, by having it like this, you can go, Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers and there will be no plosives. And even though my agent, Eric Shepard says, yeah, there's some idiot on, uh, on Facebook says you shouldn't use that. Uh, yeah, but you should use that. In which case I wrote to him <laughs> and I said, Hey, you know, it's not good when your agent starts talking about you. No, no, I wasn't talking about you. I, if I was talking <laughs> about you, I would have said some walrus face doofus. <laughs> Uh, that's Eric Shepard. Oh, God. All right. So that's, that's why bizarre. I say upside down for, I mean, if you go in any, any recording studio for voiceover, that's the way they have it. Yeah. There's all for every reason Dan just said, I mean, uh, down here, it's easier to pop. It's often in the way. It's probably on a stand that you're going to kick or bump into. It's just a lot of practical reasons why we don't put it down here. Plus it's pointed up your nose. So it picks up your nose breathing. Why exactly. do you want that? Go on. Uh, uh, Jay Horse Black. Hey, Jay. Um, will you go through the order or steps that you recommend when setting a home studio? Setting a home studio for so what? what? Uh, so okay, I'll, I'll, I'll keep reading. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> selecting the space, acoustics, then selecting an interface. Um, I'm encountering a lot of talent as of late that are obsessing over mics without setting up their acoustics or space. So basically, Jay, you're accounting a lot of folks who don't watch the show. That's right. <laughs> you could just tell them to go watch the show. You know, you could do that, right? That would help. Save us a lot of grief. Um, <laughs> recently, a few people have reached out to me to get the TLM 103 via, reached out to me to, to get, get the TLM 103 via Sweetwater recommendations of not and not have a space set for that kind of mic. We were just saying that. Yeah. yeah. If you're going to have a good expensive mic, you got to have, you know, if you're going to buy room a Ferrari, first. it's a good garage. Yeah. Yeah. Room first. The acoustics have to be squared away. The room tone has to be low. Um, if you can't get a good sounding recording out of a mediocre to affordable microphone, don't expect it to sound amazing and great all of a sudden on an expensive microphone. So you got to get the acoustics set up first. You got to make sure it's a quiet space. And you, if you're not sure if it's quiet enough, then send us a sample. I mean, that's why we can do sound checks. And Dan has a specimen cup. We have to hear the audio in context, in the room, with your voice, and really be able to give you proper feedback on what it is that you're doing. Otherwise, there's no way we could recommend what microphone you should invest in or anything like that. So don't go, I mean, okay. 
buy a Neumann TLM 103 if you eat, if, if, if you spend $35 a lunch every day and you don't bat an eye, good for you. Go buy a Neumann TLM 103. You're in a different class than many, many of us. But for everybody else that's on more of a budget, it, it, don't buy that mic until it, uh, until you've earned it. Until right. you're making the money. Exactly. Uh, Doggy Seven Mum. I think I know who that is. I, I'm not even going to guess. Can you go over how to use alcohol for mouth noise? Okay, well, let me let me run over and grab my bottle of alcohol. I'm like wired up for a right, It's right off camera? Awesome. I just happen to have some on my desk. Alcohol. Alcohol, yes. Not to be confused with alcohol. alcohol. That's right. It's not alcohol. And uh, I have a bottle of it. I've had it for years, and I've never had the guts to really use it. But you use it in a different way. It's smooth. No. This is smooth I, stuff. It's smooth. Alcohol nasal wash. You get it over the counter at the pharmacy. Don't snort Altoids. They, no, no. <laughs> they, they're curiously refreshing. Um, anyway, it's it's basically a mucus solvent and, and cleaner. And what you do is you mix this with water. 20 parts water, one part of this. And you put it in a spray bottle. And you spray it 10 times in your mouth. You swish it around. You go outside or to a sink. You spit it out. You go back in the booth. It just gets rid of mouth clicks. You know, so it I, liquefies the sticky saliva. Keeps, exactly. it keeps things lubricated. Exactly. You know, some people say, well, I'm on medication and I it, I just have really bad. Dry you know, mouth. and I tend to find that mouth, no, and I've hardly had to use this at all lately. You know, I, I've just learned if you use the right mic technique, if you're the proper distance, unless you're really, you know, like George is doing, not, you know, not, not keeping yourself hydrated, um, it shouldn't be a problem. But if, you, if it's a real problem for you because you're, you're on meds that cause dry mouth, you just naturally have dry mouth, this stuff is really, really great for that. Uh, a little more expensive than Granny Smith apples, and those don't work for everybody anyway. Yeah, but that's if you're doing a 20 to 1, that'll last you a long time. <laughs> you know how long I've had this? I think this bottle is, is used by... 713. Okay. <laughs> so that's a little out there. Yeah. It's out. <laughs> Thomas Machen. How you doing, Thomas? Uh, breaths are a normal part of communication and sometimes can be used to convey subtext of a message. <sighs> However, some audition stats will say no breaths. How do you make it sound natural? Highlight it, take it down 15 dB. That's one way. If they literally mean no breaths. Don't lot, worry. We, you don't, yeah. <laughs> well, he, well, I mean, Dan's not totally wrong. I mean, you take a, Dan, you've taught this before, I think, where you take a massive gasping breath and then you pound through the whole sentence or the phrase or the paragraph. That's right. And then you edit all those out. Yeah. There's also using room tone to replace all of the breaths with room tone using special paste. And Twisted Wave, which is really easy, and I think they call it Mixed Paste and Audition. Those are some ways to, to de-breath and have it be transparent to the listener, that you didn't delete anything. You just simply magic used a magic eraser on the breath by replacing it with room tone. That's the key. you got to use room tone. Yeah. I think the reason we're seeing that on a lot of specs is that some people just haven't learned how to breathe, which Maybe is why- they're hearing a lot of gasping and mouth yeah. breathing and halt hearts are terrible- yeah. Singers are great at voiceover because they understand breath control and they can make it last a long time. I say, look, be in good condition. You should be able to read an entire sentence without taking a breath. But George and I hear it all the time. It's like, why are you taking so many breaths? How well, often do you listen to professional broadcasters on television and elsewhere? They got to take elsewhere a breath. Elsewhere and listen to them and go, God, I wish they would stop breathing <laughs> so much. Their, their breathing is really driving me crazy. Does that happen that often? Probably not, because the breathing is there. Dan and I are breathing tonight. Isn't That's that right. a coincidence? What a concept, huh? All we're right. breathing and doing the whole show breathing, and we're at no point, unless we call attention to it, That's are right. you thinking, man, those breaths are out of control. So I think Dan's hit the, hit the nail on the head. You hear a lot of improperly delivered voiceover tracks. Absolutely. Well, Last that's... One? That's not, I think we're out of time here. All right. We're out of time. We are out of time for this particular edition of. Holy cow. It's seven o'clock. That flew. Time. As one frog once said to another, time sure is fun when you're having flies. <laughs> Dan I, turned yellow. <laughs> Maybe that means it's time to end the show. 
I'm, I'm getting <laughs> jaundiced. The liver's going down. We'll be right back to oh, say weird. goodbye after these messages. You're watching VOBS.TV. I don't know why. It's crazy what they do here. I think I'm going to go somewhere else and have a cheese sandwich. Hi, here I am in my normal workspace with a question. What's the biggest challenge you have with voiceover? What's been the puzzle you need to solve? The question you need answered. Well, David H. Lawrence the 17th and the coaching team at VRHeroes.com want to know. They're creating new courses and training, and they want to know what you need most. And it's easy to let them know. Just drop an email to david at VOHeroes.com. That's david at V-O-H-E-R-O-E-S dot com. And let him know what you'd like to know. Is it tech-oriented? Is it auditioning? Is it about booking more work, finding an agent, podcasting, audiobooks, performance questions? Whatever it is that keeps you up at night, that makes you scratch your head, or what you've always wanted to know about success in VO. Email David and ask. The email address again is david at voheroes.com. In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, voiceactorwebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact voiceactorwebsites.com, their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do. Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. Plus, voiceactorwebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. Yeah, hi, this is Carlos Salas Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching VoiceOver Body Shop. Yes, Jeff, what? spit out the alcohol. You Are you a kid <laughs> brushing your teeth that don't know how to brush, spit out your toothpaste? <laughs> yeah, you might want to learn that one. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, that yeah, was yeah. more fun than I think humans should be allowed to have. Or at least you and I. But it was fun. Uh, you know, you know it's fun when everything works right too. That's true. Like technically works well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've been working on it, but now we've simplified it. Yeah. Now it works. It'll be fine. And uh, you know, if you happen to miss the show, Not you, you, you yeah, it'll be on a week on Facebook and on our website and stuff like that. Of course, if you're hearing me say this, it's like doesn't matter because they're not it's watching moot. the show. Yeah. It's kind of a moot point. Anyway, who are next week on this show? We've got Mark Grau is going to be with us. That's awesome. We it's long overdue. Yes, very yeah. much so. And uh it, that'll be our 10th anniversary. It's really suiting. Did you tell him it was our 10th anniversary? Did that I, help him? I, I did mention that. Did that help get him on the show? Okay. I, we didn't have to I didn't have to beg him. Okay, good. He was like, but anyway, I, I'd be honored to be on. There's something appropriate about him being on the 10th anniversary. That's true. I mean, he is uh, like, he is like in the in in our world, one of the longest running studio owners who's just so well loved and respected. So yep, and and never and and an easy interview because you just go go, and exactly <laughs> it, it'll be fine. Very good. Uh, who are our donors of the week? Oh, boy. I'm going to try rating these names all correctly this time. How about Don Griffith, Stephen Chandler, Martha Kahn, Shauna Payne and Baird, Antland Productions, Philip Sapir, Thomas Pinto, Shelley Avellino, George A. Whittem, Brian Page, Patty Gibbons, Rob Ryder, and Greg Thomas. Those are our donors. You probably recognize those names because they're all pretty much, I think, all subscribers, which means they donate maybe a buck a month. Doesn't have to be much. And it's done right on the website. You can click the button for donations. It's done through PayPal. Pay once, do a subscription, whatever feels good to you. And uh, we appreciate it so much. Absolutely. And if you want help with your home voiceover studio, you can go over to George at uh, georgethetech.com or george. George it's, the, it is a terrible domain. I regret it. I regret it. It's georgethetech. And... 
if you want to is much easier home voiceover studio.com think ahead what are you gonna do yeah uh, our thanks to Jeff Holman doing a great job in the chat room tonight, getting us all those great questions. Sue Merlino, spot on tonight. She's mm-hmm. always spot on. Spotty, but spot on. Uh, but, yeah, exactly. But she does a great job of <laughs> our technical director. And, of course, Lee Penny for being Lee Penny. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. Another Tech Talk in the can. In we our- thank our sponsors? We get to thank them. We do. We our better help. do that. They're going to be mad. Oh, that's true. Uh, Harlan Hogan's <laughs> voiceover essentials. Voiceover extra. Uh, source elements, the makers of Source Connect. Voice uh, VOHeroes.com. Voice actor websites.com. <laughs> and JMC demos. Uh, Naughty.com, apparently. I, well, it is, but <laughs> just Google them. That's right. It's because Facebook doesn't like me putting all the URLs in there. Oh, uh, gotcha. Okay. And that's, that's why, you know, for a while, <laughs> they're like, you know, they were saying that like, you know, that this, you know, you, you're beating our, you're de- defeating our community standards. Oh, I'm like, sorry. No, oh. I don't think so. Sorry, Facebook. Oh. Shh, now we got to edit that out. Anyway, that's going to do it for us this week. Uh, again, if you got questions for us, uh, for your home studio or for our guest, write to us at, the guys at vobs.tv. Uh, we love getting your questions and uh, love answering them, and we're here to help you out. So that's going to do it for us. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Just remember Tech Talk. If it sounds good, it is good. Take care. We'll see you next week, guys.